Good morning, everyone. I am uh, glad to welcome you at uh, this conference that is entitled The Benefits and Costs of the European Digital Identity. I'm glad that you, you woke up yoller today. There is a Romanian saying, who gets up very early is yearning all day long. So we'll see what happens during our conference today. I hope uh, everybody is okay. Um, well, I uh, will introduce shortly our speakers for the conference, but let me make a short introduction to the topic and then uh, I will introduce our uh, speakers. In the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, the European oh. Union decided uh, there is a need for an increased digitalization in Europe and for a centralized solution regarding services and access to them by the European citizens. So part of the big digital transformation package is also the initiative on a European digital identity platform. The proposals meant to amend the regulation number 910 slash 2014 on electronic identification and trust services for electronic transactions in the internal market. The new proposal for uh, a regulation aims to change the one in 2014 in significant ways and it raises various concerns about data privacy and protection which our speakers today will be addressing. But first, a few words on what the European Digital Identity Platform called EID Wallet is and what are its advertised features. There are already digital identity platforms at member states level like It's Me in Belgium, Shavemovel Portugal, Moye ID Czech Republic, DigiID Netherlands or DigiID Netherlands, and DNA Spain, but the Commission concluded that uh, they are not used widely enough and that they are not operable across borders within EU. What is a digital wallet? It's a software, most often an app, which holds various forms of personal identification and or payment it can store your driving license, national ID, medical card, credit card, organization memberships, flight tickets, etc. What are the features and benefits of the European Digital Identity Wallet according to the Commission proposal? Every person eligible for a national ID card would be able to have a digital identity that is recognized anywhere in the EU. A simple and safe way to control how much information you want to share with services that require sharing of information. So operated via digital wallets available on mobile phone apps and other devices too, is identify online and offline, store and exchange information provided by governments, store and exchange the information provided by trusted private sources, use the information as confirmation of the right to reside, to work, to study in a certain member state. So the European digital identity can be used for any number of cases. For example, public services, financial <coughs> services, education, medical services, uh, leisure, entertainment. Now, it is stated emphatically that this should be a safe and trustworthy platform, tool that the privacy of the citizen will be at the core of it and that the citizen is in control of how much data is shared through this technology. But is it really so? On one hand, we can understand the convenience of using such a technology Europe-wide. We hear those who claim this would aid in fighting crime, preventing money laundering and tax evasion, uh, finding a missing person much sooner, etc. On the other hand, Serious questions need to be raised about the enormous amount of data that would be compiled in this way, who would manage it, and what are the risks. A robust discussion is worth having about the legal framework and the enforcement of punishment in this case is leaked or misused. Uh, 
So our speakers today will address some of the problematic aspects of the electronic digital identity framework and attempt to possibly offer solutions as well. So now let me introduce our speakers. And I will start with uh, Mr. Christian Terhish on my left. Mr. Terhish is currently a member of the European Parliament, where he serves on the Committee on Employment, Social Affairs, and as a substitute on the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice, Home Affairs. And he's an other MEPS, MEPS request, a special committee on the COVID-19 pandemic was created, where he also serves as a substitute member. Before becoming an MEP, he lived in the United States for 16 years, where he was a Greek Catholic priest for the Romanian community in California. He was also the president of the Romanian Community Coalition, an organization connecting the Romanians in diaspora and fighting for their rights. While living in the U.S., he worked as director of business intelligence for pharmaceutical companies delivering outstanding results. He's an expert in communication and web-based web -based technologies with passion for history, law, and advocacy. Mr. Terhesh has an in-depth knowledge of search engine optimization, CEO of the various programs and tech languages, and rich experience in social media marketing and strategic communication. He has a master's degree in professional communication from California State University and a bachelor's degree in theology from Babish Bole University in Romania. <coughs> and uh, I am uh, glad to discover that I also have a bachelor in theology from Babish Bole University in Romania. So until today, I didn't know this case. Too. So it's good that I make the discovery here. Now, on my right, we have Mr. Epo Bruins. Mr. Bruins is a former member of the Dutch Parliament. He served uh, in Dutch Parliament in 2015-2021, uh, where he was a spokesperson on the education, science, economic affairs, and social affairs and employment portfolios. Before he worked as a public servant, he led and managed various technology and scientific organizations in Leiden and Utrecht. In those roles, he was responsible for the research policy within various fields of physics. He advised and supported the scientific board and councils, managed staff and budgets of millions of euro, and directed technical scientific research projects. He earned his PhD from the Utrecht University in experimental nuclear physics, followed by a postdoc fellowship at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, United States. Mr. Bruns is also an accredited leadership coach and currently runs his own management and leadership consultancy, where he focuses on social and technological innovation, corporate social responsibility, and mission-driven entrepreneurship. I will stop here, and I will allow the speakers to have the floor we agreed that Mr. Bruins will have the floor first, and then uh, Mr. Terkes will follow after him. So you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, to this uh, in this very important group of people who will decide on the on the future of Europe. And I think we have a very important topic today. So if I can have the next slide. Um, yeah. It's very so, cold here. The computer thing yes. frozen. Yeah. frozen. <laughs> well. yes, wonderful. Okay. Yes. Okay. So these slides you will see in the Netherlands. And, and isn't it odd that we have these street signs? It says uh, in Dutch, beware neighborhood watch is using WhatsApp. Well, isn't that odd? These signs are produced with local uh, government subsidy. 
And isn't that state aid? Isn't this clandestine advertising? Where is Signal? Where is Telegram? Where is Slack? Why WhatsApp? <laughs> well, it is unthinkable that by entering our cities, next slide, we would have <laughs> government signs saying, well, in this city, we only use Vodafone for our telephone calls. It's unthinkable. So this shows how much big tech is being experienced as a public infrastructure, especially when there is only one dominant player in the market. <coughs> but why is it that I cannot send a message using Signal to a friend using WhatsApp? Why can't I read someone's Facebook timeline using my LinkedIn account? I have no choice because there is no real market. And big tech has won the fight over my data and my identity. Next sheet, you will see that roads, rail, sewage, water, all at the bottom, electricity, internet, these are all infrastructures governed publicly or governed under democratically established market rules. But in the realm of data and identity, there in the red box, at the interface of the public and the private sphere, we as citizens have lost control. You must imagine that big tech like Facebook and Google is free for you to use. It's free, but it's free because they sell my personal data. So now Europe is fighting back and taking back territory. And the goal of EIDAS, the new regulation, is to win data and identity back in the public sphere, governed by rules, respecting the rule of law and human rights. So today we talk about EIDAS. It's an EU regulation on electronic identification and trust services for electronic trans transactions. Now this regulation has existed since 2014. And thanks to EIDAS, all organizations delivering public digital services in an EU member state must recognize electronic identification from all EU member states. So this applies to all of us since 2018. So why are we talking about it at all? Are we bothered by it? Well, why are we not bothered by it up to this point? Why have we've been silent. Well, actually, I think, first of all, at this moment, AIDAS is hardly relevant. In many EU countries, as Mr. Chairman already said, there is a national electronic ID that can be used for public services. But this national ID is usually, well, it gives a citizen service number as output. And you cannot use this number, the citizen service number, in which you get in the Netherlands, for example, for German government services, because you're not a citizen of German, Germany. So AIDAS hardly works at this moment. So is it a bad thing that AIDAS doesn't really work? Well, not really, because you hardly need it. So as a citizen of the Netherlands, you hardly ever need to interact with the German government electronically. So the original idea of AIDAS is nice, but it doesn't work. And we do not regret that because we don't need it anyway. But now, as Mr. Chairman said, AIDAS is being updated. And the application of AIDAS in the new regulation <coughs> is being widened to the private domain. And there things are starting to happen. Next sheet. So another broadening of the scope is not only the private domain, but also the desire to control travel of EU citizens by coupling the EID to a corona vaccination passport. And I think today we need to talk about both extensions, the private domain and the controlling inclination of governments because these two are a political minefield. The AIDAS 
aims to take back democratic control over our data and identity, but at the same time, a substantial part of the European public doesn't trust governments to have good intentions. And therefore, there is a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of doubt, and a lot of emotion. So it is good that today we look at the facts, at the pros and the cons, and at the opportunities and the threats. So next sheet. Data sharing is an important driver for progress. Data sharing leads to two-sided markets using a central platform, and they have revolutionized the way we buy and sell. So at the right side, you can see that we can send electronic invoices nowadays. And at the left, you see we have, in our country, in the Netherlands, only one key for all EV charging stations. So that's quite nice. But still, at the moment, we need different IDs, different cards, and different logins for every service we use. And the idea of the new IDAS is that banks and other companies will be required to accept your EID as identification for all you do. If that works, you can issue a token from your electronic wallet just like you now hand over a plastic card from your leather wallet. But this must be done safe, privacy-proof, and in a way that we manage our own data, which should be always under our control. And at this moment, as we speak, I cannot manage my own data, and it is not under my control, because Big Tech has it all. Big Tech owns my identity, and my attributes are sold all over the world to whoever is willing to pay for it. And I want the EU to offer me a safe alternative. I want, as it's called, a self-sovereign identity, an SSI, by which I own and control my digital identity without having to rely on an external party. Next slide. Holders of an electronic wallet should control when they wish to share personal data, as well as which personal data they share with other parties. And in such a system, they authenticate themselves by presenting so-called claims to a service, here called the verifier at your right hand, to prove certain properties of themselves. And these claims or attributes can be your birth date, your name, a student number, a diploma, or a bank account number. And the claims in the wallet must have been checked by an authoritative source called the issuer at the left. Only then your claim is recognized as legitimate. The issuer could be, for example, your bank, or your employer, or your university. There is also, at the bottom, a verifiable data registry used by the holder, which is you, to share data. This can be a fully decentral system. In, in an ideal world, it would be in a fully decentral system, like a distributed ledger or a blockchain, or it could be a central database. And that is a technological difference that is, that is quite relevant. We can talk about that more in the, in the panel afterwards. So in this system, trust is a very important aspect. It is important that verifiers can trust issuers to issue legitimate, uh, legitimate credentials, and at the same time that the issuer is a trusted source of information. At the same time, it is important that users, holders, can trust verifiers in the sense that verifiers only request data they absolutely need, data minimization, and that verifiers treat privacy-sensitive data responsibly. So, under which conditions does this system produce a self-sovereign identity, an SSI, with users in control? First of all, let me say that, by design, not all SSI principles can be fulfilled 
by the European digital wallet. Privacy on the one hand, and so societal requirements such as monitoring and cybersecurity on the other hand, always are trade-offs. That's a natural law. Privacy is limited to the extent that we want to catch the bad guys, the thieves. We want to identify terrorists. We want to stop hackers. And a fully self-sovereign identity would not be able to stop the bad guys. So there is always a trade-off between, between privacy and safety. Next sheet. These are the 10 principles from Christopher Allen's vision on SSI. Christopher Allen is a US architect of blockchain technology and an expert on decentralized identity. And according to InnoPay, a consultancy firm specialized in digital transactions, the EU digital wallet is likely to fill six out of these 10 principles. So the principles of existence, access, interoperability, consent, minimalization, and protection will likely be fulfilled. Next year. You will see on the left hand <coughs> green marks. Left there is. Yes, these six will likely be fulfilled by the EU digital wallet. We can talk about these details more when we discuss it. Um, so the EU will enforce acceptance in a wide range of sectors, thus giving interoperability, number seven. The principle of consent will be met. They say it will be voluntary. Um, and uh, the principle of consent is also already fulfilled in current EU regulations such as GDPR. One of the explicit aspects of the new AIDAS will be the selective disclosure of attributes, and that will be in line with the GPR, GDPR rules on data minimalization. So these six aspects seem to be covered by the current plans. Next slide. Transparency and portability. Whether the principle of transparency can be fulfilled remains to be seen. That is very uncertain as yet. Since market parties will be allowed to deliver software, it is uncertain whether algorithms and updates of these commercial wallets will be fully transparent. We just don't know. In the present text of the regulation, this is not clear. And also the principle of portability, number six, between wallet providers is not clear yet. There are still degrees of freedom in implementation, which could make it impossible to transfer information and services to other wallets. And this carries the risk of producing a future monopoly. So our MEPs, I hope they will be very aware of that. If there is no portability and interoperability, you will create a new Facebook, which has 99.6 of the market. So next sheet. Number two and five, the principle of control, number two, cannot be entirely fulfilled by AIDAS. In some important cases, as submitting a tax declaration or registering as a donor or opening a bank account, the verifier may want to check more attributes than you wish. And at this moment, many European countries have a central register of persons for such heavy duty cases. So that's, that's fully controlled by government at this moment, uh, and that may change. And also the principle of persistence, number five, cannot be entirely fulfilled. This SSI principle requires a user to be able to dispose of his electronic identity or to modify claims over time. And in many cases, this just isn't possible. For example, the tax authority really wants to know who did a specific tax deduction, and it would not be legal to dispose of your identity after submitting your tax forms. That would be rather odd. So clearly we need to balance the user in control SSI principles with the reality of public administration. So this is, I think, the current situation where MEPs can work with. 
and they need to ask questions about everything that is not green and check the things that are green. Now, the problem is not so much the EID or the software. The problem we need to talk about today is to which extent we will control our own data and which authority and mandate do we allow to give to the government and to companies. And there is not much time, ladies and gentlemen. Big tech is an important player. And if the EU doesn't define the standards, then the industry will. There is a proper concern that if the EU does not introduce a widely applicable EID, the private sector will introduce it. Already now, Apple is expanding its wallet functionality. In some states in the US, your driver's license is a virtual card in your Apple wallet. So if the EU doesn't act now, Apple and Google will. They will not only construct an EID, but they will also be the managing and controlling party. And of course, this will at the beginning only be for commercial services in the private sector, but eventually this EID may possibly also be used for public services. And that, ladies and gentlemen, lays the ax at the root of the sovereign state. Citizenship at this moment is one-to-one -one related to nation states, but it may in the long term come into the hands of big tech if we do not act swiftly. Yes, by widening the application of the EID to the private sector, the European Commission also introduces new liabilities and vulnerabilities that do not exist in most of the present national EID, EIDs. But at the same time, if the EU doesn't broaden the scope, the private sector will. And if the European continent doesn't fight back, no other continent will. It is good to mark that at this point, any digital service of any sort inherently always confines your freedom in a technological as well as in a social way. Technology gives opportunities, but always at a cost. There always is a trade-off. Therefore, as public servants, we need to balance the benefits and the costs with every new technological service being introduced. That is the task of democratically chosen politicians. So I want to say a few words on the business model of EID. Who will pay for it? What is the business model? Well, in the Netherlands, the existing national EID, DJID, is paid for by the government. It is free to use by all citizens. But free market politics in the past 10 years has led to a commercial EID for companies to communicate with the government. So since a few years, Companies have to pay for an EID to be able to pay taxes. And I think politically that is strange. But isn't electronic ID an essential public infrastructure? So I think one could argue that it should be paid for by the government. Moreover, if you need to, to pay for an EID, this is an obstacle to privacy because if you have to pay someone then this someone needs to know who is paying. And last but not least, the third reason, the system needs to have a high level of security. If something goes wrong, there are huge risks and damage needs to be mitigated. And this makes an EID quite unattractive as a business model for the private market. So if EID is handled by private companies, either the risks won't be handled well, or the system will be very expensive. So important questions for this updated EI, EIDAS. The wallet now will be used by private companies. And then important questions arise. So who defines which attributes are necessary in the wallet? And who defines what companies are allowed to ask? Are they allowed to ask for your gender? Are they allowed to ask whether you are married or not? And which definitions of gender and marriage will be used? This is quite a fundamental question. The member states should monitor that the attributes in the wallet comply with the goal of the wallet. But will there be a European watchdog? 
I think this is still an unanswered political question. So, which authority will monitor whether an EU member state gives digital passports to, for example, Russian oligarchs, like some European member states tend to do? One could even argue that the questions being asked by private companies partly take over the role of parenting, ladies and gentlemen. At this moment, as a parent, you can decide whether your child will start a Facebook account at a certain age. You can cheat, so to say. But with an EID, the child cannot get access to Facebook until he or she has reached a certain age, which brings us to another fundamental question. Will underage children have an EID electronic wallet? And who is responsible for the proper use by the minor? And how will we treat the elderly, the vulnerable people, or people who just have no clue to use electronic devices? So there are technical, social, as well as political questions still to be asked. And I trust my democratically chosen politicians to do so. The plans for AIDAS are still vague about the technical specifications. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is an opportunity for European policymakers, but also a threat. European policymakers are now being targeted with many off-the-shelf solutions. The market clearly is ready for implementation of the EID and the lobby is strong. In the Netherlands, a majority in Parliament wants to, wants to guarantee that our data will not be stored centrally in a European system. But then, what to do if you lose your phone? At this moment, it is not such a big problem if you use your EID, because it is essentially only used for government communication. But what happens if you lose your phone and you use your EID to, to open your car, to enter your hotel room, to apply for a mortgage and to get discount in your local supermarket. This broadening of functionalities makes people quite vulnerable. At this moment, we have different cards for different functionalities and it will be one key to all. And the AIDAS plans give the digital literate people a lot of comfort and it brings the EU ever closer but the risks for individual people are not yet fully clear. The integration of all your daily business into one electronic wallet isn't the scope just too large for any system to be fully safe and fully reliable. This, I think, is a justified concern. It's like paying at the supermarket with your passport or applying for a loan using your supermarket bonus card, right? Integrating all parts of our life into one system makes our lives very vulnerable. So, next sheet. Having only one key to your entire kingdom, there may be ease of use, but it may not be wise. And at the same time, we do need the wise protection from the state to regain control of our own data and identity. I therefore end, ladies and gentlemen, with the words of the wise King Solomon, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. And I wish you as MEPs and MPs in your own respective countries the wisdom of Solomon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bruns, for uh, your presentation. I think it's very informative. And also, there is a lot of food for our thoughts for our minds, so thank you. thank you. Now I turn to Mr. Terhes, and I'll give him the floor so he will uh, share uh, probably his perspective or his concerns regarding some of the risks that uh, Mr. Bruins uh, pointed to. Thank you so much, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Before I will talk about the EID issue, I just want to share a short story with you how I ended up working on this file. I'm a substitute member of the Libe Committee, which is dealing with, besides other things, you know, making sure that any legislation that passes the European Parliament, it's respecting the fundamental rights and rule of law and all of that. And uh, I'm part of the ECR group. Uh, we are not the 
out of the three biggest groups in the parliament. So we are not getting that many files. And the coordinator of our group said, you know, sent us an email and said, well, you know, we have this file that, you know, it's allocated to us as a group. Who wants to take it? But it's a very technical, technical and technological file. I looked at it and I said, well, I worked as a programmer in the States. I want to take it. And the coordinator said, okay, take it and deal with it because we have no idea what the hell is in that file, you know, when you look at it. He said, don't worry, I'll figure it out. So I started reading the file. And the more I read, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And then I called my assistants and I said, you guys read the file and tell me what you see in it. They don't have any technical perspective, more like a legal perspective, you know, working in the parliament. And they said, well, you know, we don't see that many problems with it. You know, it would be so great, you know, to have access everywhere with your phone. You open all the doors, you know, it's such a great. He said, mm, interesting. I said, you know, I'm not going to share my opinion with you. I want to hear and listen to as many opinions as possible because I might have my perspective, you know, as a, you know, besides the thing with the church, but that's from the, from a technical perspective. But I said, let's listen to more people. So we started making phone calls and receiving phone calls from many NGOs, experts in the field, security experts, cyber experts, NGOs working on protecting privacy and all that. And then they started raising concerns. There's a problem with this issue in the file. There's a problem with that issue in the file. And I said, OK, come on board. So I had meetings with them, tens of meetings with different stakeholders because I wanted to listen to everybody. So when they start exposing, obviously, you know, they said, look, it's when I, we understand the concept, we try to evolve, make progress, all that. But look at all these risks over here. Nobody's talking about them. So you guys will be voting on a piece of legislation that is going to fundamentally affect the life of every EU citizen and nobody is paying attention and explaining to the EU citizens and to even your colleagues in the parliament about the risks. So what are the risks? And they came with the list. And I will read some of them. Then I said, have you talked to the commission? Because usually when they propose a piece of legislation like this, they have these debates on the commission side to make sure that all the potential issues are raised over there and fixed before the piece of legislation comes in the parliament. And they said, well, we'll try to reach out to them. They, you know, they barely talk to us. And if they, if we had any meetings, they never listened to us. You know, and the piece of legislation is proof of that. I said, man, this is the problem. I said, look, document everything. Because at the end of the day, when I will present this report to Libe Committee, I want to make sure that everything that I say it's properly documented, not only for you as Libe members, but for any EU citizen, because this is going to affect exactly as the, the green certificate be the fundamental rights of every EU citizen. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, every MEP is responsible for his or her vote. And I want to make sure that whomever voted in favor or against this project knows fully well why the person did it the way it is. So I said, send me policy papers, everything, so I can put them on record and present them to the Libe Committee, and that's what I've done. Now, here's something interesting that raised a concern. When they came with this piece of legislation last year, in, in the fall of no, or so, November, they said, well, you have to finalize everything by February 2020, 2022. And I said, after reading all of this, I said, it's impossible. You're asking us to come with a report from Libe explaining to MEPs how this project is going to affect the fundamental rights of EU citizens in two months, it is impossible. So I said, we need more time. So they gave us, I pushed for it, and they gave us more time until the end of May this year. That allowed us enough time, you know, to talk to all my colleagues, you know, that are the so-called shadow rapporteurs, and, you know, present this file. So this is the kind of file that some will say or will present just the good parts of it and clearly has some benefits. And others will be presented just the bad side of it. Here there are some problems. 
The thing here is we are not at the point to finger pointing, for example, you know, oh, it's just good or it's just bad. Because we have to make a decision between benefits and risks. It's exactly as when you buy a car. And this is what I said in the Libe Committee. Because some, especially, for example, the S&D, EPP, and the, the MEPs from the Renew Group, they all said, well, you know, it, this technology is so great. And I'm not denying that, that you might not have some benefits. The problem is this. It's exactly as the difference between buying a car. Uh, you assume your own risks. If you have enough money, you will buy a car that provides you more safety, let's say. If you don't have enough money, you will buy whatever you can. The difference here is that the government is going to impose these on you, explaining you just the benefits and ignoring the risks. This is like the government will push everybody to buy a car. And when marketing the car, the government will say, look how great it is. You press the gas and it's going to 200 kilometers per hour. And someone else comes and says, well, what about the brakes? Well, do not worry about those. Well, you have to. Because it's not just the benefits, it's the risks as well. And at the end of the day, it's not going to be us in the, I mean, implicitly it will be us in the parliament as well. But it will be every EU citizen affected by this. So this is what I said in Libe, and I will point out some of the risks, because it is important for us to openly talk about that. And I said the following. There are many issues with the Commission's proposal, ranging from the data protection to privacy perspective. These concerns are shared by the European Data Protector Supervisor, as well as all stakeholders consulted during the time I worked on drafting the report. I will highlight here some of these concerns, citing from the written input received from different experts in the field. This is a very technical and technological proposal, which touches on critical aspects of fundamental rights, such as privacy and private life. If the European Parliament fails to come up with a policy and a te technically proved piece of legislation, the citizens will lose any control over their private data, which will become a commodity. Unfortunately, the technical option for the implementation of the proposal are to be adopted by the Commission via subsequent non-legislative acts. And this is a problem in itself. Because we talk in the Parliament about all these great things and all these safeguards that we put in place, you know, and all these risks, and we try to remove them from the legislation. But we allow the Commission to add to these kind of acts whatever they want to the piece of legislation that will be passed by the European Parliament. And we don't have any control over those acts. It's like giving a blind check to someone, you know, to write whatever amount they want on that check. It doesn't work, democracy doesn't work that way. European Commission is not uh, accountable pretty much to anybody. Some bureaucrats from the European Commission will be able to add God knows what, you know, to this piece of legislation, and we will find out exactly after it's passed. You know, Nancy Pelosi said that in the States when they proposed Obamacare, when they printed out that huge bill and someone asked what's in it. She said, well, we have to pass it to find out. Well, it does, democracy doesn't work that way. You have to see it first, you know, analyze the first before you vote on it. So this is a very dangerous proposal project. As one technical option might be more intrusive than the other at the expense at the expense of our fundamental rights. Through my amendments, I aim to correct the issues in this proposal that fell under the mandate of LIBE. And I want to add something here. LIBE is dealing what, just with the part related to respect to the fundamental rights of this legislation. But there are many other things dealing with the internal market that's out of LIBE control. If you talk to those people from ITRE and all the other committees responsible with that, they will all emphasize, you know, as it was previously stated here, you know, it's so good for business, it's so good for that, it's good. Yeah, clearly some people will make a lot of money out of this. Clearly, very few people will have a lot of control over a lot of people. The question is, for us in Libre, and for every MEP and, you know, citizen, I would say, affected by this, do you want to pay this price? Because it's coming with the cost. 
However, I said, the proposal has many loopholes which are outside of the power of the committee to correct, which is why, for the sake of safeguarding the Europeans' fundamental rights, the entire proposal should be sent back to the Commission for a complete redesign. This is what I proposed in Libe. The majority of the groups do not accept that. We'll see how the, the final form will, will look. But this is what I said from the beginning. I said there are too many things to correct. There are too many questions unanswered. And it is not the job of the Parliament at the end of the day to fix all of these problems. Because we are just one piece of this co-legislation process. You know, send the proposal back to the Commission, let the Commission talk to all these stakeholders, find out the best solution, and then come back to us. We'll see if that if that will work, but that that would have been the, the best solution in my opinion. As this proposal is a vision, will lead to the chinification of Europe allowing the creation of a like social credit system that will lead to mass surveillance and control of all Europeans, which we should never accept. EU was envisioned as an area of freedom, and we must fight to keep it that way. And uh, when the, the green certificate started, at the beginning, everybody emphasized how many lives will be saved and how we'll be more secure and more healthy with the system. I mean, after a year or so, are we better off with it or without it? Because we saw during this time, people lost their jobs, people were forced to be vaccinated with some medical products that for whatever reason, they didn't want to be vaccinated with. And uh, where do we start this madness? And that was just the beginning. This is the continuation, and it will not stop here. Ursula von der Leyen, when ran to become the president of the European Commission, said, and I quote, emissions, carbon emissions, have a price that must change our behavior. And then she talked about the so-called digitalization. If you see all these projects that she's proposing right now, this is what she's trying to do, to change the behavior of the EU citizen in a certain way. And in order to do that, you have to control everybody because you cannot do it otherwise. Businesses, what is happening right now with the so-called decarbonization, businesses will be leaving EU because it's it's not it's not they're not making any profits here. You know, it's very expensive right now to produce anything here. So in order to reach the so-called 55% reduction by 2030, you have to, one way or another, change the behavior of the population. How do you do that? By controlling them. And this is a way of of controlling the the population, which is which is raising serious concerns. So, as far as the issues, the technological issues and other issues, you know, related to this proposal, one of them is related to data minimization and selective disclosure. Imagine now they want to put on the phone on this the wallet ID, you know, everything related to to you, pretty much. Everything from the moment you're born to maybe before you die. What happens when you lose that phone? As you said, that's a problem. What happens if you don't have internet access? What happens if you don't have a phone or a smartphone? Because not many people are that rich, you know, to buy such a phone. Some of them might offer it for you or to you for free, but at what cost? So this is a problem because right now, <clears throat> whatever data we have that is related to us, it's not in one place. It's in different places. You know, you have the diplomas at the university, you have an ID, you have this. So it's very hard for one entity, governmental entity or business entity, to have everything in one bucket about you. In order to create a profile about you, they have to take all these pieces of information from all over the place and put them in one place. You remember the scandal in the States with Cambridge Analytica when Trump was running for president and he won the presidency. Because what this company has done, I mean, Obama did the same thing. If this company would have worked for Hillary and she would have been elected, this company would have been, you know, praised all over the world. Because they worked for Trump, she, they were, you know, they happened what happened with them. But the strategy used by this company was to pinpoint certain variables about you in order to identify the kind of behavior you, you have so they can shift that behavior or that attitude from anti-Trump to pro-Trump or from 
pro Hillary, maybe neutral, and not to go to vote. And they came up with hundreds of such variables for every person. And they were able to identify or to, to pinpoint these variables using, for example, subscription to magazines, the kind of channels you're watching, if you have cable subscription, everything to you personally. This is a private company that, they, that, was, a, that was able to do that by collecting this data that was all over the place. And they were able to do it. Now imagine now with this system where they are able to pinpoint directly to you personally, it's, it's so easy to do this. At what risk and for what? So the issue here, commission, the commission is saying, well, you have data minimization, you will be able to choose the data that you want to share with whomever you want, exactly as you said. What well, this is just is giving you a sense of security over the data that you don't have because someone else is storing that data. And I'm telling you this from the perspective of a database analyst. If you have a database, for example, with one million records and someone has access just to one record because it's using a username and password, then that's how you grant the access. The person, that end user, will have the perspective that, oh, you know, I control my data. No, you don't. The one who's controlling actually the data is the DBA, the DB administrator on the other side that has access to the server. That is the one controlling the data, not you. So imagine now, this, regardless if this data is in, on one server or using a blockchain or whatever, it's spread on different servers. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the one controlling the data is not going to be you. You just have the impression that you control the data. No, the data will be controlled by the guy controlling the servers. The question is, who's going to own the servers? It's either the government or some of these private companies. The que my question to all of, not only to all of you, to anybody is, do you want your data to be actually in control of someone else or not? They were not able to answer that. Another issue is this. There are two terms used in technology now. One is identification. The other one is authentication. What we do right now, for example, when we log in on Facebook, LinkedIn, email, whatever, we don't identify ourselves to these companies. We authenticate. We use a username and password. They are called credentials. If these credentials are matching whatever they have in the database, they allow you to pass the gate, to pass the login form. But the companies usually, they know who you are as a virtual user, for example, but they cannot pinpoint exactly who you are as an individual, as a human being. Now, what they want to do here with a unique identification as part of this law, this proposal, it's not only to force, I mean, they don't force you to authenticate. You have to authenticate in order to access anything. But they want to force you to identify yourself before you authenticate. In order to do this, they are imposing on the browser companies to introduce some, you know, add-on, whatever you want to call that. That like before you go online, you have to authenticate, you, uh, you have to identify yourself. So they will be able to track exactly who you are and what you do and everything. I was contacted by all companies that are building browsers right now. Mozilla, Google, uh, everybody. All of them said the following. If you guys are passing this bill the way it is proposed right now, EU will become the most vulnerable place on earth to navigate online. Because what is happening right now, if you go on any website, you go on Google, anywhere you go, they have what is called right now an SSL connection. I don't know if you heard of it. You know, usually you have the protocol HTTP S is now, and that is creating a secure channel. It's called from you as an end user to the server. So if, even if someone is intercepting what you do, they will not be able to read what you're communicating with the server because the 
data, it's encrypted. So what they want to do here is force the browser to have a certain certificate, quad, quad certificate, introduced here. So between you and the server, there will be another entity that will be able to read everything that you transmit, for example, from your computer to the server. And all of these companies said, look, you see what is happening right now with Russia. This is going to create a vulnerability not to hackers, which are more individuals you know, or groups of individuals you know, fighting for a certain cause. But you are creating the risk where the identity of all or of a lot of your citizens will be exposed to foreign governments. What are you doing in that case? Talk to the commission, and they were not able to answer that question. Actually, someone from the commission said, well, we never envisioned this. We never had this in mind. This is not what we wanted to do. I said, look, I'm not here to judge your intentions. I'm not God. We are going whatever is on paper. This is what we care about. Because at the end of the day, when if this law passes the way you guys proposed it, you know, it will affect the people the way it is written, not the way we intend it to be. Nobody will know your intention. So these are some of the problems that I tried to address during the, uh, the period I drafted this report. And unfortunately, the commission was not able to, uh, to answer them. Uh, at the end of the day, as I said, this is the decision that we have to make. We have to analyze the benefits versus risks. I'm not, you know, they are clearly, you know, you can see a lot of benefits of using a system like this. You know, it would be way easier for a lot of people. You don't have to have 20 different credit cards, you know, in your pocket and diplomas and all that. Everything is on your phone. Great. What about the risks? And the question that we have to ask is, are we able or are we willing or do we afford to pay the price? for the risks that are coming with the system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, let me check my uh, watch. And so we have uh, some time for questions uh, till we have a coffee break. I think coffee is here, but we still have some time. If you have questions for our speakers, feel free to address them. So we have about probably 15 minutes. Yes, Johannes, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Oh. What? Oh. Microphone. Okay. okay. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, indeed, indeed it is. As long as, oh my, uh, this is very dangerous to speak here, clear enough. No, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Terrace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Browns. Uh, really very enlightening, all of this, both the content and also the legislative process, shall we say. Uh, there's one thing uh, you both kind of referred to, but didn't get much, uh, now not much of a stage here, but we all know that um, we're part of a geopolitical, um, well, clash is just a bit too big a word, but at least um, we, we see clashes on that end. Let's put it that way. Uh, um, obviously, there's the terrible war in Ukraine, but we see it elsewhere as well. I mean, hackers do not just come from Russia. They also come from Iran, and they come from uh, North Korea. They come from China. I haven't heard um, yet that that dimension here, well, Mr. Brown's referred to hackers, but I, I would think that a system like this has this huge risk in this specific geopolitical environment that we are in. I mean, it's not as if we are in the 90s, right? And I, I think that, that before we move forward, we have to put this whole issue in the bigger picture of the geopolitical realities where we are. 
because the hackers on the other end are not like a bunch of criminals, but state-driven entities. And um, we, we need to be, um, at the very least, very much aware of this. And, and I have not an idea that this has been resolved yet or taken on board yet. Thank you, Francis. So is this question for both speakers? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Johannes, thank you for your question. Um, I think it is, it is very relevant. And I think it is good to say that any system can be hacked. Any system you can build can also be hacked. And of course, already now, uh, sometimes we have uh, systems down for a day or a couple of days, and that gives much an, well an increasing number of problems. And for example, if your bank is hacked, you will not be able to buy or sell. Um, so sometimes we we have a technical disturbance that in our country we we cannot buy or sell uh, for a couple of hours. Um, and then, well, usually, uh, then then the country uh, goes quiet, and nobody just nobody goes to the shops for a couple of hours. But imagine that this this will result in a standstill for weeks. That would be a disaster, of course. So any electronic system can be hacked, uh, and also this system can be hacked. And I think that is not fundamentally different than the present electronic systems. But of course. If this EID controls the whole of your life, I mean, then style. then uh, there is an, uh, a total standstill. And I think it's very important what Mr. Terhesh said about identification and authentication. Um, uh, if you cannot authenticate, you still exist yeah. <laughs> as a person. If you cannot identify, then this first principle of existence, this, of these 10 principles, uh, the first one was existence. If you cannot identify, you do not exist in, in the world of doing business, uh, buying and selling. You just don't exist. So um, I think it's it, uh, in that sense, an EID where one system controls the whole of your identity and the whole of your data, that is a, a, a that is a, a fundamental difference. The second fundamental difference, I think, is that we have indeed three big geopolitical blocks in this world that have a huge internal market. So that's the US, that's the EU, and that's China. Those are the three huge internal markets. So China is already going this way. They know that, that if they uh, control the identity of people, they have one internal market that can be controlled. The US is technologically far behind. They still pay with paper dollars, right? And you tip the waitress with 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 paper, right? We, we don't have that here in, in Europe. So it can give us a huge technological advantage if we create this one electronic market. Um, but we, you're also in the risk of creating a China-like state. And there I think the three different cultures of the three different geopolitical blocks come into play. We are not Americans. We are not Chinese. We are Europeans. And what does that mean for this topic? And I think that is a very fundamental cultural question that we have to, have to ask ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Tahir. The issue of hacking was was addressed during this uh, discussions that I had with all the stakeholders. And uh, as I said, it was the first the first one to raise this issue were the browsing company, especially Mozilla. They were the first one who contacted me and said, "Look, you are exposing with this everybody to the risk." But then talking to the other experts in the field. You know, there's more than what they propose with the, uh, to the browsing companies. I mean, if you look at, you know, there are certain things that I, I'm reluctant to share publicly because they were kind of classified with some of this. But look at Estonia, for example. Estonia has a similar system. And one of the persons that is co, that is co-rapporteur, shadow rapporteur on this file is from Estonia, from the S&D group. 
And I contacted her and I said, look, put me in touch with whatever governmental entity from your country is dealing with this EID system, let's say, in, in Estonia. So we had a guy, you know, that was working in the Estonian government and we asked him questions. And I said, have you had any breaches, security breaches? <clears throat> because this is the question. And he said, yes. Now, if you have a border with Russia over there, you're under attack, cyber attacks from Russia on, you know, daily basis. What are the risks of having a system like this, for example, that is falling in the hands of a hostile state or a hostile government? And we were told, besides other things, that, you know, imagine that all of your data, everything about you, gets into the hands of your enemy. They can use that data to blackmail you, especially if you are a person working for your own government, if you are an elected official or an appointed official. Someone comes and says, well, on this date, on that tower, you were somewhere, right? You either do what we tell you to do, or we go with this information public. What are you doing? You remember when Snowden in the States was able to get all that data from NSA and expose it publicly. He was one person. And he was able to expose a US intelligence agency with everything that they've done. That's how we found out about that Patriot Act and many other things that were done by Bush behind closed doors that even the Congress, the US Congress, was not aware of. And he was just one person. Now imagine if all the data that relates to you personally, that is your data, pretty much we are at a point right now where we say that's who you are or who we are, gets into the hands of your enemy. Are we willing to pay that price or to be that exposed? This, this is, it's a, it's a very serious issue. On top of that, imagine, you know, if you work in the military, for example, you know, you have officers, generals, in your own military, that all these data about them get into the hands of the enemies. What do you think is going to happen? And I give you a historical perspective. You were all aware of the war in Georgia in 2008. You remember. Russia invaded Georgia and they took South Ossetia and Abkhazia from Georgia. Then there was the war in Crimea, or not even the war, the, the special it's operation, it's whatever you want to call it. And everybody, look online, experts in the field were saying, how were the Russians able to move that many troops in Crimea without the intelligence agencies intercepting any SIGINT, it's called, signal intelligence, to be able to counter their movements. Do you know how they did it? Because the Russian officers gave orders on paper, not on radio. They receive a piece of paper and they said, on this day, this time, you got to be there. Another piece of paper to the, nobody, they, they did not know of each other. This is how they were able to conquer and to occupy Crimea in a matter of days without facing any opposition. The situation is different now because they have to fight, you know, the, the size of the land that they try to conquer it. But this is the risk. The Russians were aware, aware of the risk of, Yuri Sigin, of using Sigin to, you know, to fight in Crimea. They used, they went back to Paper orders, orders on paper, and they've done what they've done. Americans are so, but they're safe. But imagine the risks here. I mean, we were told by experts. It's like, you know, we try to bring all these perspectives, you know, security. It is unbelievable risk that we, and, and, and not only risk, you know, I mean, it's imagine going naked on the street. That's what we are doing right now. We are exposing, giving the chance for every EU citizen, you know, to be undressed, undressed pretty much, <laughs> in front of the world. Are we willing to do this? 
or let's say if you implement a system, like how can you make it, you know, as you, and I agree with you, it's any electronic system, it's, it cannot be 100% proof. It's enough for one person over there to sneak in and do some stuff and it's done. But at least, you know, if we are aware and we acknowledge that it cannot be 100% bulletproof, at least limit its use. Find ways where, you know, you don't force people to use it. Minimize the risks, yeah. Exactly. See, exactly as they done with the green certificate. It is voluntary. Yes, it is. But if you don't have it, you cannot exercise certain rights. So the whole, the whole relationship between the individual, the person, and the government is changed. The way EU was developed, and I, this is the reason why I think it's important, especially nowadays, to go back to the founding fathers of the European project, to see how they envisioned this you know, European community that evolved to the European Union. You know, they never had in mind this idea of a super state that is gonna control the lives and, and options of every citizen. You know, if they wanted to have that, you know, they would have copied the system from Soviet Union. They wanted the opposite, where the rights and 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 uh, fundamental rights, I would say, of every person of every European is respected and and guaranteed by a system like this. You know, that's the, even the reason why they split. You know, the economical part on one side and the fundamental rights on the other. You know, and they came up with the. Uh, with the European Court of Human Rights and all that, so yeah, the, it is. There are more questions, Christy. Yeah. So uh, Adriana wants to ask a question. Yes, Adriana. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping. Also, yes, I, I was hoping I can speak loud enough, but uh, this works. Um, in the past, when we were talking about, uh, for instance, social media and data leaks and data, data mining and even disinformation. Many times the solution that was um, advertised, especially by experts or uh, even journalists, was that education is the answer. If you educate the public long enough and hard enough and accurately enough, they will be able to make informed decisions and own their data and protect their data and uh, um, make a difference between what is fake and what is real online and uh, um, not have their, in, their behavior influenced or, or moderated by a third party. Now, in this case, in the case of our own personal data being owned by someone else other than us, and that data being used for whatever purposes um, at some point, do you still think education has a role? Do you still think if enough people are aware of the intricacy, the complexities of all these things, that they will, what, oppose it? Or if it does pass, if what the Commission is proposing does come to pass in Europe um, at, at the European level, do we still um, have something to do? Do we still have a responsibility? Do we, can we educate the people? Do we still, does education still have a power or a role in this matter? Yeah, I think education has a has a huge role here, but this one goes both ways. Because the other side could say, if we tell them the same story over and over again, they will start believing. Right? So you have to, in order to educate people, you have to present both the benefits and the risks. And they have to understand the consequences. Because it's not just, you know, 100% uh, benefits and, or 100% risks. No, it's both. But again, it's a decision that you have to make. It's not a clear-cut decision. It would have been so easy. It's not the black and white. The problem is, is that this proposal is coming with black and white, with benefits and risks. The question is, are we willing to put people at these risks for the so-called benefits? This is the, it's, it's a moral question, it's a legal question, and it's a responsibility question, pretty much. In my case, I won't. I will oppose this all the way to the end, because I don't believe in it, and I don't think people elected me in the European Parliament to expose them to such a risk. In two years from now, 
if I will not be elected, then they will elect someone else. And that person will say, yeah, we want to expose everybody. I don't have a problem. But at the final judgment, I can say I've done my part. Same thing with the green certificate. If I don't, if I, if I see it the way I see it, and the way it is affecting the risks that it's exposing these people, I, I can't support something like this, regardless of whatever benefits on the other side. Thank you. Yes, if I may add, Rihanna, are you well educated? <laughs> I like to think so. You like to think so. So if you enter a new website you've never been before, do you press accept all cookies or do you press never. select my preferences and then read 32 pages of text and after <laughs> about one and a half hours you can decide whether you want to enter the website or not. Well, let, let me not give you an answer. I will give the answer. I always press accept all cookies. I just don't like have time to. I don't have the time to read all this. So yes, we can educate people, but uh, I, I mean, and, and in Europe we have introduced the opportunity to deny cookies, right? So, um, but um, educating people always is good, but we have this liberal view of humankind that if we educate people enough, they will become civilized and they will have good intentions. And we have lost the awareness that there are bad guys out there with bad intentions and all they want is money and power. And we have lost the awareness that that is the fight we're fighting. And just by educating people, we cannot win this fight. There will always be bad people, well-educated, but bad people. And um, big tech is making money out of our identity, and we just can't trust them. But luckily, in Europe, we, we are the only continent fighting that development. I think the new question now, since the COVID pandemic, is do we trust our government still enough, that they have good intentions with us? Do they have an American future view or do they have a Chinese future view or do they have something in between which is called European? And I hope that European is not only in between American and Chinese. Chinese. I hope European means that our government uh, sees a future where human rights and human dignity are protected. And that is, I think, where legislation comes in. Um, the development we are seeing will be inevitable uh, and it will be either in private hands or in the hands of the government. And do we trust our government enough to protect our basic human rights? I think that is essentially the question, whether we are educated or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, you're right, Mr. Bruins. Uh, education doesn't, yeah, doesn't guarantee uh, that everything will go uh, well. We need to be aware of our sinful nature, and our sinful nature requires a coffee break. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> I announced the coffee break, I saw that you, yeah, you had a question. Yes, Berchan uh, has a question. Okay, sorry, sorry for uh, disturbing your program, <laughs> you uh, I have one question for Christian. Uh, Christian, you mentioned that the EU or the government can use this system maybe also in, let's say, trying to influence our behavior. And for me, it's clear, uh, talking, for example, about the, the Corona certi COVID certificate, it was uh, an example of that the government was trying to uh, influence our behavior. Can you give more examples for the future? In, in what way, are, what are you thinking about? Uh, in what way can uh, uh, the EU use a system in the future uh, for, let's say, influence our behavior. What do you think about that? I looked into it because when I, there were two statements in 2019 from Ursula von der Leyen that kind of raised my eyebrow. First one was that Europe was built on the Greek philosophy and Roman law, and she forgot to mention anything about Judeo-Christian values. And you cannot talk about the European project in Europe without the Judeo-Christian values. If you take these out and you leave everything, 
to Greek philosophy and Roman law, you will find justification. I said it even in front of her when she was in the parliament. You will find arguments for tyranny, for slavery, and for disregard for basic fundamental rights. It was Christianity and Judeo-Christian values, you know, that, that created a foundation for everything that we call today fundamental, basic fundamental rights, because we are all created equal, equal in the image and likeness of God. Okay. So that is one thing. The second, the second statement was this that I mentioned, and I repeat that. Emissions have a price that must change our behavior. So it was not about reducing the carbon emissions. Is about changing the behavior. So in order to do that, you have to create a system that is controlling the options of people in order to change their behavior. And this is where I see the system being used right now. You will see now if you go on many supermarkets, more and more on many uh, whatever products you buy, it will tell you how much carbon dioxide was used to produce that product. And you will see that we use more and more. They are already talking. I mean, we just said in the parliament a week or so ago, thank God it failed, but it will be proposed again, the carbon quotas for companies, right? Now, let me give you a scenario. What about carbon quotas will be used for people or imposed on people, right? You have a certain carbon quota that you can use right, per day or per month. How are they able to track that? Through a system like this. You go and you buy with your wallet, and they already know everything you bought. They know all the products, right, from your recipe. I mean, it's not, it's not conspiracy, and it's not absurd what I'm saying. If five years ago someone would tell you that in order to fly a plane in Europe or to cross the border, you will have to show a QR code, they were make you a conspiracy, right? Well, look what is happening right now. And I'm reading what more and more experts are saying, and they are raising a concern about this. Because even if they force companies to, re to reduce their carbon emissions, they are leaving the EU right now. They are moving to countries you know, outside of the EU because they, it, they cannot work here, make any profits, and sell any goods or products on the global market because it's too, it is too expensive. So you still have to reduce the carbon somehow. The only option left is to force or to change the behavior of people. Last year, for example, the European Commission approved, approved some cockroaches that could be used for, you know, eating. I don't know if you saw that, right? A few weeks ago, some European department, whatever, said that there's a problem with the cows in the EU because they are producing too much pollution. So in order to save the planet, we have to reduce the number of cows. i give you an example. That means less milk, less cheese in Europe. That means higher price for them, right? So when you go and you buy them, if you ate too much cheese, for example, you were part of producing a lot of climate, whatever, you know, carbon stuff. So it is a risk. I might... Right now, when you listen to me, it might look like it's too extreme. I hope it will be. I hope the time it will prove me wrong, and I accept that. If five years from now, if what I'm saying right now, it will not happen, or 10 years from now, I don't have a problem to come and say, look, I was wrong. But what about if I'm right? What about? OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, now we have uh, our coffee break, 15 minutes coffee break. And after the coffee break, we'll have a panel and you'll be able to ask more questions. You know, we have a panel discussion after the coffee break. Am I right, Adriana? Whoever wants to um, ask questions online, can... online? Can OK. Those who are watching us online, feel free to send your questions. I don't guarantee you'll get an answer, but at least we will hear your questions and panelists will hear from you. Enjoy the coffee break. Yeah, let's continue our conference. Uh, in the first part of our conference, we heard from uh, Mr. Terhish and Mr. Bruins. Now we'll have uh, a panel discussion, and this panel discussion uh, I will allow uh, 
the panelists to, to share their view on this uh, subject. Then hopefully, if they are uh, concise enough, uh, we'll have time for questions and you can address questions. I have also some questions prepared for them. But uh, now uh, we will uh, allow them first. And we have, in addition to our two speakers, we have in our panel with us Mr. Berchan Rassen. He is an MEP um, representing uh, Holland. And uh, he also is a member of SHPM, member of ECPM. So he will uh, be with us today in this panel. Then uh, on the far right uh, from me, we have, <laughs> it doesn't mean that he is far right, but who knows, yeah, you are in the middle. Uh, we have Michal Povazan. Michal is a personal assistant and policy advisor for uh, Anna Zaborska, who is a former MEP and a member of the Slovak, no, MEP, and the for, uh, former MEP and now a member of the Slovak parliament. Uh, and she's a member of the Slovak Kristianska Unia, which is a member of ECPM. So we welcome Mr. Povazan with us. And uh, next to him uh, is Inga Bite. Inga served in the Latvian parliament, and now she is also a board member for the advisory council of the ECPM. So uh, we, I uh, welcome the panelists, and now I will give the floor to Mr. Rassen to, to, to start, because I thought, let's start to those who have not spoken yet. And then, uh, but everyone who is in panel will have a chance to speak. So you have the floor, uh, Mr. Rassen. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this event about this really important uh, uh, topic. Um, one might wonder, should the ECPM organize a WHO conference on this topic? Because we are talking about just a number and we know that digital services are important. And in order to act, to get access to these services, yeah, you need to have a number. So what's the problem? Huh? That that's could be a question, but indeed I fully see the, the risks as mentioned also by uh, by our two speakers and there's indeed sufficient reason to reflect on the proposal of the commission because we are not just talking about a, a, a number we are talking about a, a wallet a digital wallet a wallet full with uh, a personal information oh well sorry uh, personal, valuable, personal information. Yeah, it's, it's about, uh, he's quite heavy, that wallet, sorry about that. <laughs> Your digital wallet will not be heavy. No, <laughs> I, I, no. well, uh, <laughs> um, I, I thought about thinking about a wallet, maybe it's, it's, it's better in this respect to, sp to speak about a safe, uh, a safe uh, where you can store valuable things in it, and a safe, you can only open a safe by a key. Um, which brings us to one of, I think, the main concerns of this uh, uh, proposal. Who has the key to open our safe, our box, with personal information? And the commission said to us, well, you don't have to be worried about that. Uh, you as citizens, you are the only guy, you have the key. Uh, but to be honest, and I fully agree with what Christian said about that, uh, maybe on paper it's the citizens who have the key. But in reality, what will be the practice? I'm afraid that in practice also the government or maybe also companies uh, will get at least a part of our key, I'm afraid. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm really critical uh, on the proposal which is now on the table. Um, I am also critical, I think that was an issue also mentioned uh, by, uh, by EPO, I'm also critical about the scope of this proposal. Yes, I can understand that for getting access to digital services of a government that you need to have a key yeah, or, or, or a number. 
but do we really, really, really need this system also for uh, checking into a hotel or for renting a car somewhere? I don't see the needs. I checked in yesterday here in the hotel with my passport. Passport, it works quite well. Why do we do I need in the future to have a digital key for a digital number for that? And I, uh, here I really see a great risk of what I call over-identification. When this system is introduced, I foresee that many companies, maybe also supermarkets, for example, will also use it. So that we are going in the direction, I'm afraid, that you have to identify yourself everywhere in the society, everywhere, which means that there's a great risk that the government and also companies can uh, are able to track you and to monitor you everywhere. Um, and I'm really wondering, is that the society we want to end up in? Um, and maybe another point of concern is what, what about the people who don't like to use the system? Uh, and the commission said about that point, oh, well, you don't have to be concerned about that. Christian, Christian already mentioned that uh, because the commission said, well, the system is not obliged. You are not obliged to participate. But then, indeed, exactly uh, what, what Christian said, see what happens with, uh, with the corona, with the QR code. What happens? Well, when you decide, well, I don't like to use a QR code, you were excluded from a lot of services. And that, I think, is the main risk also for this system. Um, the last point of concern I would like to mention, Chair, is that I'm really critical about the European philosophy behind the system. It, it is the philosophy I hear every day around me in Brussels. It's the thought, well, we have a problem, and what we need is a solution. Uh, we need a European solution. That's, all, that's always the answer I hear. Um, so this is also, in my opinion, uh, an example of a, of, of a clear trend we see in the direction of... Uh, of uh, European integration. Um, and we have also to think about what, what can be the consequences in the longer term uh, for that system. For example, uh, when you are a, a, a European federalist, uh, you would like to give the European Union also the competence um, to collect taxes uh, and then it is really handy to have already a EU number instead of a national number. I don't, we are not already at that stage, but there's also maybe a risk in the longer term that they can use the system also for more centralizing things. Well, you hear uh, my opinion. I'm really critical. I, I can't imagine that they can support it. Uh, and uh, what's now, according to me, what's now on the table, I, I think as ECPM we have to be real critical on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Rosson. I uh, I will go now to Inga Peter. Uh, and uh, what uh, you, you ended with uh, your opinion, uh, what ECPM should. Uh, you know, should do in this regard. So I think this is also will be for other speakers. What ECPM, what the position of ECPM should be concerning this uh, EID. But also I would like, Inga, if you can tell us, are there discussions about this topic in Latvia, Latvian parliament? Or, so feel free now to share your view on this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for having me here and for the questions. Um, I have to admit that the first time I really heard about this issue was uh, when I heard about this conference. Mm -hmm. So this is the answer to your question whether the information has been spread. Um, I'm not in the Latin Parliament anymore, but I'm still, uh, as, as we talked yesterday, you can never be an ex-politician, so I'm still following what's mm -hmm. going on. And therefore, I would be quite uh, 
convincingly, I could say that there have, have not been any discussions mm -hmm. in Latvian Parliament or in Latvian society regarding this. Um, I would say that uh, I can also imagine the reaction of the Latvian society, and uh, we have heard a lot already today that the first um, comparable which comes into mind is the QR code of the COVID because it is very recent experience. Uh, we are not sure what will happen in the autumn, whether it will come back. So um, I would say that this is a trauma in, uh, in the society, in Latvian society definitely, but I also think that uh, in other societies, that there's one moment that uh, you cannot enter the shop, so you cannot enter a restaurant, you cannot enter any public premises, uh, you cannot get uh, public services um, in person uh, if you do not have this code. And um, you can lose the code, okay, then you can always download it. But um, you go together with your passport and everybody at the door of the supermarket uh, is entitled to check your passport and to see the picture of your passport and to compare it and if you have colored your hair then you have to explain to the person that you are the same person. And if he doesn't believe you, you cannot go into the shop and buy bread. So um, this has been quite an, um, an experience, and uh, I think it would be a problem to repeat something like that uh, so soon. But uh, if you ask me about the possible position of PCPM, of course, it, it should be discussed. But... Um, uh, can we have the picture? Yes. yes. <laughs> I think that um, this uh, is the question where policies should go behind people and not before the people. What do I mean? Uh, we can build a very nice path, but if people do not use it, there is no use for this beautiful path. So what I see here is that this is a path that we are planning to build, and uh, we don't know if people will choose to use it. And, well, according to the, your introduction, you said in the beginning uh, that there are similar systems which are not being used. So maybe people don't use it because they don't see the necessity for such a universal system. So if we introduce it, uh, the question is whether there will be a plan B. For example, yes, we have Facebook, we have Google, we have WhatsApp, but we still have a choice not to use it and to exist as persons physically or as persons digitally. We can still receive public services. We can still pay in a bank if we are not on Facebook or if we have we an have email somewhere else, not on the Google. Uh, we can communicate by ordinary telephone or we can communicate via signal or other applications. So there are choices despite that there are some dominant players in the market. Um, this is what I think should be also the position of ETPM that the choices or the plan B or the plan C <coughs> should remain there. For example, if I lose my bank card, if I have uh, distributed my risks, I, I probably have, and many people have accounts in two banks, so they have two bank cards. If I lose one of them, I can use another, or I have some cash in my wallet. So if I lose both of them, I still have cash to pay for a taxi or to pay for bread. Um, so I can get out of the situation. If I lose my passport, I can use my ID card, and uh, I can get another passport, uh, but still I can buy bread. I can get into my car and go home without my passport. Uh, if I lose my car keys, or if, it, or if they are stolen, I probably cannot go home by car, but I can go home by taxi, I can go home by train, I can get into my home, and uh, I can solve the situation with my car. Uh, if I lose my phone, it's a disaster because all the life is in the phone, but I can still buy bread, I can still get home, I can still get into my home, I can then solve the situation with my phone. So I have a plan B 
yes, it is something somewhat a problem if I lose something, but I still can continue existing. But what if I lose this digital wallet? What if I lose the key to it? What if the key to it is stolen? What if another person can access all this information, including my car, including my home, including my bank accounts, including my uh, digital identity in the relationship with public administration, including EU? Uh, so how can I prove that I am me and that somebody hacking or using my account is um, somebody else? Uh, we were talking about the systems and hacking the systems as a whole, but maybe it's an attack uh, on the individual, as it can be physically, later it can be digitally. We already talked about uh, bad people that will probably always exist, and there will always exist bad people who want to grab all the system, but there will always exist somebody who want to attack this particular person, uh, Inga, for example. And what, did, what about such kinds of attacks? They just want to play with me and not let me into my house. Or if just one day you can you have no access to your money or something else. So so directly targeted uh, attacks. Um, again, I come back to, to the plan B. If I can still exist and uh, be in the relationships uh, with the public administration, uh, buy things, uh, get to my home um, without this, um, then it's it's a choice. But if I cannot really exist either physically or digitally without this, then it's it's not a choice anymore, and then it's a problem rather than uh, than a, a positive thing. So again, returning to this picture, maybe this is uh, the issue where we build the paths, well, where we first see where the people go, what they want, which is convenient for them, what are they ready to use, and then we build the path there, rather than building the path around and having uh, people walk uh, their old paths anyway. So that would be the thank first you, comment for the first much. round. Thank you very much, Inga, for uh, your perspective on, on this topic. And now uh, I will go to Mr. Kovazan. Uh, if you can give him the microphone, because Adriana tells us that it's better for the old time very strict. Yeah? <coughs> Adriana is very strict. Yeah, she is uh, able to. She's uh, a little uh, ruler. <laughs> now we will ask Mr. Kovazan uh, his perspective on this topic, of EID, and also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, for uh, Ms. Tite, what about Slovakia? Is this topic discussed in the parliament, in the society, and as a member of this board of the ECPM, what should be the position of ECPM mm -hmm. on this, uh, on this uh, you know, issue? Thank yes. you very much, Mr. Chair. And I would like to, to say thank you very much, ECPM, for uh, this kind of conference, because um, people don't know about this. As Inga said, uh, uh, few minutes before that yesterday when we heard about this conference it was first time when we really understand that uh, this is behind that policy on digital services the digital services are not only about uh, technical issues as it is um, discussed in our mass media as it is discussed in uh, in uh, our national parliament but it is a bit uh, something a bit more a bit more than this uh, let me start with maybe anecdotic comments on this based on Slovak um, historical experience. Um, as you probably know, that Slovakia went through communist regime since 1948 until 1989, and it was communist regime which uh, introduced national IDs first time in our history in 1955. And the reason was obvious. They wanted to know who we are, where we live, uh, who are our parents, our kids, and so on and so on. They collected a lot of information that in, in those small books, and every one of us uh, was obliged to keep it all the time with us. So to be simply under surveillance of uh, almighty state. 
uh, it was in the past um, experience from uh, from a recent recent past. Um, just a few months ago, we lived uh, with my wife and, and kids um, in our capital. We had a nice apartment in the city center. We bought it. It was really, really amazed with that. But after a few weeks, we were tired because we need special card for everything. If you know me well, you know you, you would know that I can lose everything. <laughs> so sometimes I was trapped inside of the house inside of the basement, in the garage, outside of the house. So because without that card, I cannot do anything. So once I had to uh, sleep in my office because I lost the card. So this is just anecdotic uh, comment, but it can uh, show the reality which can be in front of us, as Inga well described. So we need to to be careful on this, but it doesn't mean that uh, we uh, we don't have to work on intelligent solutions, which will keep our rights, our um, our uh, comfortability um, on place. So we need to do that. And back uh, back to Slovakia. Uh, up to now, there was no discussion at all about this. As I said, it, it was a technical problem. So I'm really glad that uh, I'm part of, uh, of this conference because I can go back to Slovakia and to start to, to, uh, to talk about this and to, to put it on agenda of, uh, of our political party that, look, this is a really important thing. We need to start to talk about this, that the uh, Minister of Interior is uh, from our, uh, our uh, coalition partner party, party. So we need to talk to him. I know him. He is uh, with his background as, as former policeman, and he served uh, a lot of time in, in secret service. So, so he's open to these kind of solutions because it's so easy for uh, security services to follow everything, to collect uh, data and so on. So for them, it's like uh, manna. But what about us? For ordinary citizens. You know, I always go back to, uh, to me and to my family and to my community. I, I live with my family in a really small village in far countryside from, from our capital. 300 inhabitants, nearest town, 5,000 inhabitants, and it's the, the biggest city there. Uh, but those people live in completely different world. We can call them rednecks and, and so on and so on to, uh, to laugh on them, but they are real. Hey, and um, if I want to find uh, how to fix my car in that county, I cannot go to internet. <laughs> I need to ask my neighbors. So, and we cannot change them. Maybe European Commission has the plan to uh, to teach European nations how to do that. But I can tell them that uh, it's job for centuries, <laughs> not for next few months. So we need, and they need, to think how not to abandon a lot of our citizens. Not only on the, on the European level we need to do that, but on national levels. It is still nation states have something to say to this. We need to protect our citizens, because if we don't do that, we will create maybe two parallel societies. One, rich uh, city society and another one abandoned society in countryside and uh, what is our goal our goal is uh, stable prosperous society but with parallel societies inside of one country inside of european union it won't be possible so i thank you very much ecpm and mr terhesh uh, to bring this topic uh, to our table we need to, to talk about this seriously Thank you. Okay, so what is your, you know, like opinion uh, on ECP. should the uh, ECPM, uh, how should ECPM should position uh, mm -hmm. itself? Uh, uh, I think we are on the beginning of discussion. I, I, I consider this conference as the first one, okay. as something like a small cake for us. Yes, okay. So we need much more information and we to spread it. Okay. 
uh, not all our members uh, are me uh, members' parties are members of the par national parliaments, but some of us are. So uh, let's talk to each other. Let's do, uh, let's involve um, civil organizations who are members of ECPM uh, as well, and uh, to push this um, this topic as soon as possible because time is running out probably. Yeah. Well, I come back now to our speakers, and I'd like to ask Mr. Bruns. Uh, you heard that in Slovakia nor in Latvia there were no talks in the parliament. If I'm not mistaken, in the Dutch parliament there was a discussion about this. If you can tell us about short about that discussion, and again, if you have, uh, would like to add something. What would be your recommendation for the ECPM MEPs in this? Uh, Concerning this issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, oh, the microphone. Yeah, we can. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so in the in the Dutch Parliament, there has been a discussion about this, and uh, a majority of Parliament has given conditions um, to which this European ID uh, should be uh, comply. Um, and otherwise, they say they, uh, they they do not want it. So these conditions are, for example, it must be voluntary, uh, so you're not obliged to take an EID, uh, and um, data should not be stored in a central European system. Um, and uh, in essence, it should be a national ID that, uh, and you talk about the interconnectivity of all the national IDs in, in Europe. Like an exchange, but not a central. Uh, exactly, an exchange and not 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 a central European system. Mm -hmm. So I think these are good conditions that they uh, put on this, and I'm I'm glad that a majority has voted for this. At the same time, I think AIDAS, the new regulation, already fulfills these re criteria. So um, I, I, to to uh, connect with um, Mr. Ruysen. Um, we, we all will be handed a key. Mm -hmm. We will get a present in the coming years, and it's a key. Mm -hmm. Well, a present, you get it offered. You don't have to take it. And everybody is happy with the present. So you get a key. Nice. Oh, it's a nice key. Okay. So I think we, in the political process that will now start, I think we should not talk about the key because the key will come. We should talk about the doors. The key is there to open doors. If there are no doors, it's a nice key, but you cannot use it. So it's a, it's all about the doors, and uh, the the political process I think needs to talk about where and when will be will we as citizens be confronted with doors, where it will become clear that the key was not a present for fun, but it was a present because people planned to put doors at some point. So where and when will we be confronted with doors? And then not just doors, but locked doors. Locked but doors. That yeah. is yes. important because if yes. you have a door you can open, yeah. it's not a problem. But so it's not about the key, it's about the lock. lock. Yeah. It's about the lock, lock and the door. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then if I, if I, am confronted with a locked door, what part of my key is needed to open the door? And can I open the gate in any other way, like Inga said? Mm -hmm. Is there any other way to open the locked door? Mm -hmm. Then, or is there this, only this one key that was given as a present? So are there other keys that fit the lock? Um, and can I choose which key to use? Are there any alternatives to the key I got as a present? Uh, and I think the last question is, what is behind the door? Uh, why would I want to open the door to start with? What if I choose not to pass the door? Can I live? Can I eat? Can I move? Can I travel? So I think, dear politicians, talk about the doors, the locked doors. Which ones will there be? I like a key. I mean, this is a key, right? This is what it will look like. I like it. I can do a lot. But what doors are there 
for which I need it, otherwise I cannot eat or live or move or travel. I think that is the political discussion. What locked doors will the key be used for? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good thoughts. And now I will turn to Mr. Tervis. Mr. Tervis, uh, since you are from Romania, you can tell us also about Romania, if you heard any discussion in the Romanian society or the Romanian parliament about this, and then again, the question that was addressed to all panelists, uh, what should be the position of ECPM uh, on this topic? To keep uh, an eye, to, to learn more, or what would you recommend? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, there's not much discussion in Romania about this. The topic is still new. Uh, while I was drafting the, the first report for DBE, I was contacted by some media outlets, foreign media outlets, for interviews, and I said that I'm going to uh, postpone any interview until after I, I will draft the first report because that's the fairest way to do it, you know, in regards to the process and to my colleagues from the other groups. Now that the report is public, I will be speaking more publicly about this because it's important for all the Europeans to understand the risks of, of this. And if they want to accept the risks, I mean, it's at the end of the day, their choice. Uh, as far as the position of ECPM, I would analyze the position not from the EID perspective, but from the individual perspective. Because at the end of the day, we are a political movement. They want to implement in the public life certain policies based on Christian values, biblical values, and everything starts from the individual. So the question is, if you look from the individual perspective, is an individual better off with the system or not? Is the individual exposed to certain risks if this system is implemented or not? And if, you know, clearly these we have all these risks, you know, are they good or uh, how dangerous are they to people? Clearly, they are pretty dangerous, you know, because it's exposing the person, it's exposing the individual, it's exposing the identity of the person, it's exposing everything about the person. You know, you have many people who are saying, uh, well, I don't have anything to hide. Really? Then why do you have a key to your car? Why do you have a key to your door? Why do you have a key or a password and a token to your bank account? Give it to me. Do you trust me? You know, put your username and password, you know, right there in front of your house so everybody that passes your house can log in into your bank account. Do you trust everybody that much? Because the question about protecting this privacy of yours, you know, it's not about you, it's also about them. Because we created this in place. Because not that's a problem with us, it's a problem with everybody else. It's not, as you said, not everybody is a saint, a holy, holy person, you know. You don't know how they will use that information against you or to gain more power over you or to whatever, you know, steal money from you. This is the reason why, I mean, if you look in the Bible, this is what happened after the sin. You know, Adam and Eve were naked, they were not aware of it until after the sin. And this is the kind of world that we are living in right now. We don't live in that world before the sin, it's after the sin. So if we have to take note of that and look at everything from this perspective. So as far as the position of ECPM, what I would stress out, and this is what I'm, I mean, it's, a, it's my opinion I, here, I would say, mm -hmm. is we have to emphasize that it's important for the individual, you know, in order to express freely his or her rights and wishes and stuff, you know, not to be constrained and conditioned by the government. And the, a system like this is creating the framework that could easily be switched where people would be conditions, because this is how the system started. Initially, they say, well, let's create this system that when you look at it, you say, oh my God, it's not okay. But it will be, it will not be imposed on people and it will be voluntary. So let's just vote for it. Then you create a majority in the parliament that votes for a system like this that is not mandatory yet. But you never know when that majority changes or something else changes, and just one word is changed in this legislation, and from voluntary it becomes mandatory. One word. And that's it. So we have to be, you know, as 
Reagan said when dealing with the Soviets, you know, trust but verify. Do you trust the government that much to put everything in the hands of some bureaucrats, unknown bureaucrats and unelected bureaucrats to decide everything about you? I will not. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katia. Thank you. Well, now we still have some time. I'm uh, thankful that our panelists were uh, short in their first presentation. Now I'll open the floor for questions, and I see that Mr. Van Dusburg would like to address a question. And if you have a question, uh, in this case, if you want a question, it, tell us if it's for everyone or you want just uh, one of the speakers to answer your question. Because this is also important. Not too close, okay? Okay, so at least. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question for uh, Mr. Terris and Mr. Rausen about the European Parliament. First, the question is to Mr. Terris, what is the procedure? How long will it last, <coughs> approximative, till this will be implemented? What are the steps? Uh, be adopted. Um, and um, also to uh, Mr. Rausen, what I think, like, if we think about Green Certificate, European Parliament, supported it, it's like free travel and so on. Then certain moments you see that countries are using this certificate in different elements, you know, like to exclude people, like in Latvia we see that uh, very happening very restrictive. And how much do you see the danger that this can happen with an EID as well? So these are the two questions. And, and the both what can ECPM actually help the members of the European Parliament actually uh, with this? In, in uh, how do you call it in stabilizing these discussions or other maybe means okay yes mr Rison, you can start and then mr Kerkes. so you, you understood the question about the procedures the european parliament how long the procedures maybe yeah, oh, yeah the i think the christian yeah, is more involved in the procedure yes, yes okay. about about the the risk i see in this respect i really like the comparison with with keys and doors <laughs> um and um, I see indeed a real risk in this respect, uh, Leo. Look, this is the key of my office. Um, and my office is quite, I have a lot of confidential material in my office. But what the Commission is asking us now is, well, let's give everybody the permission, uh, supermarkets, uh, hotels, uh, everybody, uh, give them the permission to use the same key the key of my office. Um, so I see a big risk that by creating this one unified key system, I see a big risk uh, that uh, we are stimulating more and more, let's say, closed doors in the society. Um, and that uh, you, give, you stimulate that also companies in society ask again and again for uh, an identification. And that's what I call the over-identification. Um, so I'm really well, wondering whether we have to go in that uh, direction. And maybe it's uh, coming back on the question, what can we do as ECPM? Maybe it's an idea uh, to prepare a, a statement uh, with the, the four M M M M MEPs about uh, about our opinion, uh, but that's more a point of uh, the procedure. Okay, thank you. And you have the microphone here, Mr. Kattis. Yes, you thanks. Tell us. As I mentioned during my presentation, this project is divided among multiple committees in the parliament because each one, each committee is dealing with it from different perspective. In my case, from the Libe committee, I uh, proposed the first uh, report. Now I will have to, you know, my colleagues from the other groups propose amendments. We have to find a compromise. This is the magic word in the parliament. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how that compromise will work. And uh, we will have a report out of LIBE, which is an opinion that will be attached to the main report from LIBE. But there are certain articles in this regulation that where we in LIBE have full competence. In other words, we are the one in charge of certain articles. And I will be trying to push as much as I can to make sure that those articles are safe or offering enough safeguards, I'd let's say, uh, in order to protect the, the fundamental rights of the Europeans. But here's another issue. And you mentioned the issue of the green certificate. This is a regulation. 
not a directive. So regulation has direct application from the EU level to national states. In other words, the national parliaments do not have to pass a law in order to have this regulation be implemented. And we've seen what happened with the green certificate. They created a loophole in the regulation that allowed the national governments to use an EU regulation as they wished. And the person, the individual, was left without any defense in front of this abusive and tyrannical system. And I'll give you an example. You cannot attack or challenge in the national courts an EU regulation. You have to go to ECJ. But you have 90 days after a regulation is passed to attack when in a normal procedure that regulation to ECJ. And this is what happened with the green certificate. They passed the green certificate in the month of June, and for 90 days they haven't implemented it. You know why? So you could not go in front of the court mm -hmm. and claim that any of your rights were violated because you have to claim and to show proof. You have to provide an interest, as it's called in law, to make sure that they can judge the case. They cannot just judge it in principle. They have to show they have a direct interest in why you filed that claim. Otherwise, they will reject the claim. They will not even look at the merits of the case. So for three months, they haven't done anything. Then the regulation was implemented. Then the national governments use the EU regulation to ban you from entering stores and blah, blah, blah. So now you have to challenge that in a court. In what court? Because in the national court, you cannot challenge an EU regulation. In order to go in front of the European Court of Justice, you have to go to a national court and ask that court to send a question. It's taking two, three years until that question comes back from the court if this regulation is okay or not. So you're pretty much left defenseless. This is the same the same thing might happen here. So this is another aspect that we have to that we have to look uh, that we have to look into. It. Okay. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's all. Okay. Is it enough? <laughs> For the, yeah. yeah, but I they think they, they, they want to push it by the end of the year. By the end of this year? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there other questions uh, from the audience? I might have one question. You have, oh, well, well, it's interesting. Um, Panelists have questions. You are here for all questions. Uh, then, yeah. then, <laughs> then you have to answer it. Uh, well, you have a question for other friends. But I'm, not a, I'm not a technical person, so I feel that those people work, uh, talking here are more technical persons. Um, is it technically possible that we have for the same doors, uh, for each door, two keys? Yes. One the universal key and one another key. Master key. And a, so, and is it, uh, well, it should be legally possible to implement this into the regulation, that that is an obligation that each door should have at least one alternative key? Can I answer that? Because, you know, my colleague Rasmus mentioned about the key. Look, in the European Parliament, you know who has the key to all the doors? The cleaning people. <laughs> I'm serious. Yes. Yeah. There's a universal key that opens any door in the European Parliament. So whatever confidential material you might have in your office, it doesn't matter. Lady can because the see. lady who's cleaning your office can yeah, yeah. open that door with the universal key. I'm serious. I was shocked when I found that out. OK? So whatever you live in your office, so if you made a comparison with this, you know, yes. whatever you leave in your office, you know, it can be checked by a lady exactly. who cleans your office. By a cleaning lady, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, technically, there there are no limitations. Essentially, we can do we you can program any software you would like. So there there is no technical restriction. Everything is possible. Perhaps that's the scary part of it. Um, <laughs> So it is, it is really about um, which key will open which door, uh, which mandates do you give, um, and, and uh, will it be voluntary, will there be alternatives? I mean, that's, that's all the questions that need to be uh, answered. Who will build the key? Is it open source? Can we check it ourselves? Um, will there be a central database? Will, it not be a, will there not be a central database? So we, you can build anything. 
uh, but it's it's the right questions that need to be asked so that in the end indeed there will be alternatives it will be uh, open source so that we can check it uh, and and uh, putting the right conditions into the text of the regulation will be um, a hell of a job for the coming months okay are there other questions well, uh, I, I would like to address a question as Leo did to, to our MEPs. Uh, what is your uh, feeling today? What I got from you, Mr. Terhish, is that uh, this legislation is most likely to be passed by the end of the year. Now, how can we, as ECPM, you are uh, in the European Parliament, and probably you can talk to your colleagues, how can this legislation uh, be improved, uh, having in mind uh, what Mr. Bruin said, because there are risks there. Will you try to at least raise some flags or table some amendments? What would be, at least we will pray for you, but if you can tell us, you know, these are... Uh, some actions you plan to to do, actions that will minimize the risks, uh, actions that will raise the awareness, and then you know maybe there might be some even uh, flash mobs, some protests. I don't know, you know, but this for a politician, I think it's important to think also other instruments how we can influence the adoption of that legislation. What would be your again thoughts on in this regard? First, clearly, we will have to fight the, the battle in the parliament, you know, providing amendments, you know, tabling amendments, speeches on all, all of that. And we will be doing that. Uh, we have to have constant press conferences and press statements about this in order to raise awareness at the national level, because the pressure must come from all the angles. Mm -hmm. uh, we have in each one of our countries plenty of NGOs that are fighting for privacy and for human rights, and we got to get in touch with them. If they are not aware already about the problem, we have to make them aware. They are already, for example, Brussels Hub is one of the one of the the, the NGO in Brussels that's very much into this and, and it's very concerned about the issue of privacy. Uh, there are many other NGOs that I can provide to all of you that are they have the technical and the legal expertise behind in order to provide arguments why there's a problem with the with this solution in order to forward those arguments to, you know, our counterparts or any interested party in our, in our countries. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to make the citizens aware about this because they have a huge influence over the MEPs. I remember when the green certificate was in discussion during uh, the plenary in 2021, we received tens of thousands of emails and phone calls and letters and contacts from people we were bombarded with, with, uh, with messages from people, and it has, you know, enough effect, I would say, on certain MEPs. Now the situation is different because back then many said, well, we have to save people, it's a crisis, blah, blah, blah. But now, no, we are not in that situation. And if enough people will react, enough citizens, I think they can uh, change the minds of, any, of many MEPs, you know. Not many of them are aware yet about this problem, but, you know, we have to uh do what it takes to uh, to make them aware yeah. yeah make them aware yes okay yes mr mm -hmm. yes well i think it's, it's really important as ecpm to be vocal on this issue mm -hmm. because uh what i see in the netherlands is there are a lot of concerns about not only about the green certificate when i post something about the green certificate that I am critical, I get a lot of likes eh, because it makes clear that it, it, it's still an issue. People don't like to have, again, a green certificate. But there are also a lot of concerns, what I hear about uh, uh, digital yeah, wallets. Yeah. So it's, I think it's crucial to be vocal on that. Uh, uh, I think we as ECPM can make clear that we, we take, the, let's say, the risks and the concerns real serious and that we will try to think about a better alternative. I think more based on mutual recognition 
instead of centralizing uh, everything. Um, and um, also with, I think, uh, a smaller scope of the system. Uh, I have big concerns about combining uh, the public domain with the private domain in this respect. Uh, why should we use this system for private, uh, also for private uh, services? services? Yeah. I think uh, we shall not go in that uh, direction. Mm -hmm. And I fully support uh, Christian on that. We have to do our work now in the parliament and mm -hmm. to work together on amendments and so on. And Christian is really active in, in the Libby committee. I think that's the main committee we can do our work. But indeed, let's work together on that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Michal, you raised your hand also. I think you'd like to add on this. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. I want to continue with uh, new tradition. The panel is having a question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our party in Kresenska Unia of Slovakia has uh, no uh, member of European Parliament, but actually we are part of Slovak governmental coalition. So similar process as is uh, going on in, um, in European Parliament is probably on the side of, of, com of uh, council. So uh, can you advise us how to, how to in which way to influence our government to, to approach this, um, this topic in yeah, the yeah, in the council? Is the concept. I, I think it's an important yes. question. Yes, thank you. Here's something the, the, the procedure, especially when a regulation like this is proposed, is that a regulation is sent initially to the national parliaments and they have to vote on it. So if you are part of a, of a coalition government in your country, that means that you have a majority in the parliament. See if your national parliament already passed a resolution or a decision that in regards to this regulation. If they did, Try to find a way, you know, to reverse that if the, the decision is in favor of this regulation. Because usually, what they do, they send these proposals to the parliament in an early stage where you don't know all the facts. So you pretty much you vote blindly at the national level on these regulations, and then later on, when they come into parliament, then we start debating and talking, and we are like, oh man, there's a problem with all this. So, in my opinion, the national parliament should vote on this after. There's a vote in the in the European Parliament, but after the discussions about the because there's no way for them at the national level to know. So try to find that out. That that would be the first thing. Second, clearly in the council, if you can, if, if especially you said that the Minister of Internal Affairs, it's you know he's part of the he's called um, Joel Joda or something like this. The uh, the where all the Minister of Justice and Internal Affairs are, mm -hmm. are meeting. You know, that's not the place where these issues could be raised and try to find uh, a majority over there. Clearly, I think the Poles and the Hungarians will be will be against it, but, you know, you might find more, even, you know, the the current majority from Netherlands more than likely will, will oppose this. So, with, with the NAP rhetoric, if, if this subject is properly raised in the media and through all the yes, social channels, you know, uh, more and more people will be aware of it. Okay, so it's uh, going as just small small comment. Uh, in few days, Czech presidency is going to start. So I think wow. it's good opportunity for, uh, for this because of our partners, the Czech Republic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now, yeah, Mr. Bruns would like to add. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I can add to this, so uh, I think you also have to prepare for a Plan B. If you cannot stop it. Use your democratic processes to um, to influence the text of the regulation. So when you when you have national uh, nationally treating this regulation, then um, ask these questions that I've put forward uh, this morning. So uh, does the regulation um, define which attributes are necessary in the wallet? Does the regulation define what companies are allowed to ask? Does the regulation define whether there is a European watchdog and what its mandate is? If these things are not in the regulation, it's not a good regulation. Yeah. And then you use the democratic process to improve and improve and improve uh, so that if something is going to exist, it will be better than without you intervening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very good uh, approach and good suggestion. 
uh, we are coming to an end. Let me see what Adriana wrote here. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. I uh, have no more questions, uh, but I uh, would like to just thank everyone for taking part into this conference, and especially I would like to thank our uh, first two speakers, uh, Mr. Tehersh and Mr. Bruins, for their presentation. And I agree here with uh, Inga Bitte that their presentation uh, raised awareness. I was not aware of many things until I listened to their presentation, which tells us that if we spread this information to as many people as possible, then we can get support from people, from voters, to influence where possible to stop some legislation, or at least to improve that legislation, to minimize those risks that uh, that now we, we became aware of. So I think this is very important. It's important also for our national parliaments, as Mr. Povazan also raised the, the, the question, uh, because uh, the national parliaments and governments, uh, they can influence through the European Council, uh, through their commissioner, they also can influence, you know, the position that will be taken finally in the European Union. So uh, I'd like uh, again, once again to thank everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eisen, also for your presence here. Uh, thank the ECPM staff for organizing it. And uh, uh, not last, I mean, not least, is uh, to thank um, uh, Contigo Mas and uh, Jose Carlos Sabian uh, for being with us, and not just for being with us, but for hosting uh, the General Assembly of the ECPM and for hosting this conference. Uh, once again, I, I mentioned this, and who knows, in the time will will uh, will probably prove it. But uh, the, this meeting in uh, Madrid, uh, I think, will play an important role for the life of ECPM and for you know for our uh, continuous fight for values. As Mr. Terke said, we will fight. So. We are called to fight, and uh, we are fighters, as Apostle Paul said, to fight the good fight, yeah. good, good thoughts. So this is our role. So once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, those who watched us on YouTube today. Thank you for not sending difficult questions to us, but for our, your appreciation. We wish everyone, uh, you know, uh, blessed weekend. Those who will travel, safe travel, and once again, I'd like to, to, to stop here and let's applaud everyone for, for the time and for everything we've done. Okay, if there are some announcements, I don't know, Marie or Adriana, that need to, need to be made, you can uh, come here or just make announcements. We have a cocktail now. Cocktail here or upstairs? Uh, upstairs, you think? Yeah. So you are invited to a cocktail upstairs, and then those who need to check out are probably you can check out. Those who are here this afternoon enjoy the afternoon in a very hot Madrid. <laughs> Tomorrow it will cool down. So if you stay here one more day, you'll really enjoy also a better weather. But, uh, <laughs> The weather reflects the spirit of our discussion here, so, or the topics at least that we <laughs> tackle. Once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.